literally, and uh, our first speaker is literally going to be talking about Aboriginal gardens and finding a way through the Hunter Valley. But it's also temporarily, this is the beginning point, the, the first section is looking at the early colonial period. Um, but also figuratively, for Newcastle Hunter Studies, that here are three papers that are helping us as we're trying to find our way to, to what that actually might be. So our first speaker today is Mark Dunn. Mark is a PhD student at the University of New South Wales. Uh, he was born and bred in the Hunter Valley, but is living as an expat now, sadly, in Sydney. Uh, Mark's been a professional historian for many years, working on a wide variety of heritage and public history projects, and has developed some expertise in the area of oral history and methodologies. He was president of the New South Wales History Council from 2009 until 2012. He has a Master of Applied History from UTS and has currently returned to study, as I mentioned, uh, this time at UNSW, working with the amazing Grace Carsons on a project to rival her epic history of Sydney, the colony. Mark has taken, as, in, as his area of interest, the interactions of peoples and place in Hunter Valley in the early colonial period, and he's going to speak to us today about one aspect of his research, uh, the title of Aboriginal Guides on Hunter Valley. It's good to be working in the Hunter and learning more about it. Even though I didn't grow up, I'm starting to find I didn't really know that much about it. And it's good to talk to people up here about it. So thank you for having me. And I suppose it's very appropriate for the paper I'm about to give, but I just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're on today, the Waterloo people, um, custodians of Newcastle and other Hunter groups and any Aboriginal people that are here today. So. Okay, in, on March the 21st, 1820, explorer John Howe from Windsor wrote to Governor Macquarie from his camp at Lost Plain, to the plain up on the Hunter River. And he wrote, I embrace the earliest opportunity to inform your Excellency that I reached the river on Wednesday last. And in our way down the river, we came through as fine a country as imagination can form. Now, how claimed the discovery of the first overland route from the Hawkesbury to the Hunter Valley. And for his trouble, he was arranged to land along the river around the future town of Sydney. How's story is relatively familiar to those who have a passing interest in European exploration and settlement of the Hunter. However, what has been largely lost in the 193 years since is that how success was built on the previous attempts by at least two other European parties out of Windsor and would not have succeeded at all without the assistance of his Aboriginal guides. This paper then explores the role of Aboriginal guides in the period between 1819 and the mid-1820s when the first overland expeditions into the valley by Europeans were being undertaken and the valley was filling up with white settlers. It builds on recently published work by Greg Blyden of the Wild Dipper Institute at Newcastle University, the University of Newcastle, and draws on the journals and letters, diaries of Europeans who benefit so much from the guides that they employed. In his book, Black Pioneers, Henry Reynolds wrote that Aboriginal guides have rarely been acknowledged in the story of Australian exploration. With a few notable exceptions, the common theme of European exploration was one of heroic European men in the battle against the hostile Americans. The European explorer was central to the land of the developing nation, and there was no dispersive group left for the Black Pioneers. And yet, Aboriginal guides have been part of the explorer and settler experience from the very first days of the colony in Sydney. Now, Aboriginal guides, interpreters, and trackers had also been a feature of Newcastle Penal Station from the start. In 1801, the first official survey of the Hunter by Lieutenant Grant on board the Lady Nelson included Bunbury, an Aboriginal man already well known in European circles and city for his skills as an interpreter and intermediary. He'd accompanied Matthew Feeders on expeditions twice already, once up to North Lake Island and the second time to Harmon Bay, and he would go with Feeders once more on the circumnavigation of the continent in 1804. Bunbury was what Reynolds refers to as a professional guy, someone who lived close to or in the European settlements, and it was taken on to travel full time with an exploratory party. These guys possessed expertise which combined traditional knowledge and an understanding of European culture and language. These men, they were most often men, had vital bushcraft skills. 
skills such as tracking and hunting, pathfinding along the most desirable routes, and they were able to read the landscape and other familiar territory. They could act as interpreters or intermediaries through their knowledge of neighbouring language or an appreciation of traditional customs and diplomacy. But even before 1800, the Aboriginal people were assisting Europeans in the hunting. In July 1796, the crew of a fishing boat was wrecked at Port Stevens and walked back into Sydney, having been guided along the coastal path, first to the Hunter River, and from there on to connecting paths by Lake Macquarie and Broken Bay, all the way down to the north shore of Sydney. Sydney Harbour. The men were likely to have been escorted and hand on the new guide as they proceeded south, and this was the first, the early, the first recorded party that was guided through the island. Now, the unnamed Port Stephen guides and boundary represented the start of 20 years of Aboriginal assistance in the penal station at Newcastle. Throughout the period from 1804 until 1823, Aboriginal guides assisted the local authorities in the tracking and recapture of mines and objects. The use of Aboriginal warriors as trackers of the Estonian convicts was one of the primary forms of deterrent employed by commandants at the station. And again, Bungaroo featured prominently in its capacity, being the first Aboriginal tracker identified by name at Newcastle with the recapture of runaways in October 1804. I should point out Bungaroo was involved in Newcastle's story right through the 80s up until about the mid 1820s at the very least. He was from Broken Bay. But guides were also employed to take parties from the surrounding bushland on kangaroo hunts and on fishing expeditions. In 1821, the former commandant James Wallace, who was in charge here at Newcastle from 1816 to 1818, wrote in the nostalgic 19th century terms of his Newcastle friend and guide, Burrow, when he reminisced. There are scenes in all our lives to which we turn back to with pleasure, though perhaps with a tinge of melancholy feelings. And I now remember poor Jack Burrow, the black savage ministering to my pleasures, fishing, kangaroo hunting, guiding me through trackless forests, with more kindly feelings than I do many of my own colour, kindred, or nation. Now here Wallace outlines the main reasons for Europeans employed guides, not least to guide them through the scene of trackless forests. The trackless forest, of course, was a misnomer. For while looking like the wilderness to most European, the bush was crisscrossed with pathways and tracks used by Aboriginal people to travel across their country and beyond. But while the penal station operated, I'll go on and show you this is an image that's in the exhibition at the back, you can see down the front what we think might have to be was with a European and an Aboriginal man behind coming in from the kangaroo line, which is quite a lot of a man behind. Yes, so while the penal station operated and it was uh, operated, there was very little exploration into the hunt beyond the margins of the settlement. It was not in the interest of the commandants who bush to be known place to the convict workers hemmed in by. But some convicts were familiar with the bush. The convict timber gangs were by the very nature of their work, exploring the bush and moving through the forests. Ironically though, the timber gangs reported fewer runaways than the convict gangs working in the settlement. The one reason given by the Commandant James Morrissey in 1819 was that he chose his most trusted convicts to work out in these gangs. Aboriginal men were employed as guides during the European occupation or invasion of the Hunter Valley from 1818 until the mid 1820s. This was the period between the discovery of the overland route from Limsa by John Howe in 1819 and the first allocation of land grants to European settlers. Now, Howe made two journeys to the river. The first in October and November 1819, when he actually reached the river, close to the current township of Jericho Plains. And the second in March 1820, when he came out of the Boulder Mountains near what is now Singapore. On the first expedition, Howe assumed he was further north, close to Port, Port Stevens. It was only when he travelled downstream on the second trip and came across the timber gets camp at Port Plains that he realised he was actually on the front of Howe was following the footsteps of two earlier attempts over the mountains from Windsor by William Parr in 1817 and Benjamin Singleton in 1880. Now both Parr and Singleton had failed to find a way through the mountains. And this is an image from Parr's journal, as you can see. That's looking from Parr through the mountains towards the uh, mountain that he did in his journal. So you see why he might need some help with it. Now Parr had no Aboriginal guide with him and became disorientated in the steep valleys and mountains around the Bay area, which is where he stopped. That were at the time of blaze and the rage of the bushfire. 
Singleton, however, did have a gun, but he also turned back near the bloody area, around about 100 kilometres from this time. Although Singleton's party might have cut in half the time of the path, their journey beyond was ended by thick brush and struggle to find water. His guide is unknown in his journal, but may have been unfamiliar with the territory he was about he was asked to enter. Now, the night before they turned back, Singleton's party was attacked by an unseen group of Aborigines who rolled bottles down into their camp. The attack was badly unnerved the Aboriginal guide, who thought they would all be killed, according to Simon. The following day, the party encountered a group of up to 200 Aboriginal men resting in skins and armed with spears. Despite the attack of the night before, the meeting was cordial, and one of the Aboriginal men, named Maori, could speak some English. Now, Maori gave him directions to good grass beside the wine river. However, it appears that the combination of the attack and their meeting convinced the guide that to proceed further into the country of other people was full height, and Singleton agreed, fearing he said that they would be betrayed for their provisions and for the fact that their guide was not escaped. <coughs> Singleton missed the opportunity. With his own military guide acting as an intermediary in the encounter, Maori had presented him with the local's knowledge of the way through the country to the Hunter River. Now, how made no such mistake? His party had been for five months after Singleton in October 1819, with eight Europeans and two Aboriginal guides. One of his guides was named Miles, and would have been well known to Howe, if not the others. Now, Howe was the chief constable in Windsor, and in 1816 he had been involved in the suppression of Aboriginal attacks in the Windsor. In July of 1816, Governor Macquarie had released a list of the 10 most wanted Aboriginal resistance leaders in Windsor, giving permission for settlers to arrest or, if necessary, kill them if they were encountered. At the top of this list was Miles. In November, after several of the Aboriginal people on the list had been killed or captured, Macquarie issued a second proclamation, offering a pardon for those remaining men who surrendered. The inclusion of Miles and Houses party suggests that he was reconciled with and had been accepted by the Europeans. Presumably he had come into the settlement sometime after the Quarry's proclamation, and his bush skills, which had been so in the attacks of 1815 and 1816, were now recognised as being necessary and valuable to the project of expansion in the new country. Whatever the anxiety remaining among the Europeans over travelling in the uncharted bushes and identifying the resistance leader, or with Miles himself about leading men who put his name on Deafness was soon to put aside for this trip. Now, Miles guided the party beyond Putty, where they ran into the same problems as Hiram Silver had encountered. Instead of wandering on, Howe sent Miles and another guide out to search for a local guide. Unsuccessful the first day, he sent them out again, wrote, writing in his journal that he had quoted, sent two natives out for a native guide as we could proceed, proceed no further than the direction I wanted to go. By sending Miles out to find local guides, Howe is perhaps displaying a more nuanced understanding of the way Aboriginal cultural practice and witchcraft operate. As Singleton had found out, not all Aboriginal people were familiar with the country outside of their own, nor were they necessarily welcoming. Miles may have advised Howe on the fact that they needed a local connection, as much maybe for guidance as for a rite of passage. Henry, Henry Reynolds has argued that local Aboriginal knowledge was one of the most valuable resources that European explorers could acquire, for it provided them with an intimate knowledge of the country they were passing through. The local guide, identified later as named Murphy, took the party through the mountains and out onto the floodplains of the Upper Hunter River. However, the route was at times arduous and difficult with the pack horses needing to be unloaded and other times having to detour around the swamps and bogs. The party did not penetrate far into the new valley. On the first day there, the camp was approached by an Aboriginal man and soon after by another five. How reported that these guides, Miles and Murphy, were much alarmed and refused to go further. On their return to Winter by the Aboriginal camp that Murphy had come from, another older Aboriginal man named Worley admonished Murphy for taking them the hard way and told how he knew a quicker and easier route. The advantages of having the Aboriginal guides are apparent from these accounts. The guides had enabled how to move more quickly through the landscape and warned him of the potential danger of being another group's country and 
came through the knowledge of God and suggested a better route. Now, in what appears to be a first step colony, three weeks after the return and under the direction of the government of Warrior himself, Miles, his brother, Mulloway, who is probably the unnamed second guy in the first expedition, and a small number of natives were provisioned, equipped, and armed with muskets and sent back out to meet Worley and another man from Pondagra and followed their track to the ground. Nineteen days later, the all that original exploring party returned and reported to how that they had made the valley along the new path. Miles was presented with a breastplate and a musket for each trial. Howe followed them off back through the rangers along Worley's pathway with a new expedition of 16 men. He was given a grant of 700 acres on the banks of the Hun River after climbing and discovering the overland way for himself. <laughs> this is a sort of a map chart. So the first the white line going to the left is the original expedition out of the territory plains. And the red off to the right is the Aboriginal pathway that was then followed back in the single. And if you know this part of the, you can see how rugged it is, but if you also know this part of the world, that's now effectively the party road. So it follows the Aboriginal path. Now, Miles' rehabilitation in the eyes of the Europeans was complete. In the space of four years, he had gone from hunter rebel to guide to rewarded explorer. How's use and trust of Miles speaks to the personal relationship? that was necessary for the successful collaboration of exploring and God. A high level of trust was needed on both sides for these four races of unknown territory. Despite this, his role as the guide of the expedition was later to be almost entirely forgotten. The downplaying of the of the Europeans in their official reports was not uncommon, and in Miles' case, his appears from the story of 1820 and then one of from the history of the Hunter Valley of the his was a fate shared by most Aboriginal guides in the historiography of exploration in Australia, where the Europeans would write heroic accounts of their own achievements, while at the same time lessening the impression of their dependency on their guides. Now, while the advantage of using guides by Europeans is clear enough, why would Aboriginal men agree with that? Without the push of the guides themselves, we can only speculate on their motivations, and the experience of Miles may give us some clue. Miles had until recently been a wanted man. The very name he had been given by Europeans suggests someone on the outer. The name Miles is probably a derivative of the Aboriginal word my art, meaning stranger of the wild. Gaining the confidence of Europeans by a successfully conducted expedition would have been a, uh, an advantage for Miles on a potentially volatile frontier in which he lived. Being with an armed party of Europeans while heading into another group's territory may also have been strong motivation. Now Tiffany Shellen and her book Shaking Hands on the Frontier, which examines the relationships formed between Europeans and the King Yana people in southwest western Australia in the early thirties. She says that Aboriginal guys recognise the advantage that new knowledge of distant country can be for them amongst their own people. Knowledge about new country and new people is a valuable commodity that can be traded and benefited from and could elevate a person's stats in the eyes of their own king and those of the Europeans. This is no doubt the same it's true for the country region. <coughs> Outside of security and status, guiding provided access to European goods and weapons. Clothes, tobacco, and food were routinely handed out by European explorers to Aboriginal elders and guides. However, in some instances, as we've seen in Miles' case, others were rewarded with muskets, which would have been a highly prized acquisition. And yet, by 1820, when Miles meets Howe, there's enough evidence from the city region around the P and the Hawks River over the Blue Mountains and the Western Plains that guiding Europeans was facilitating the invasion and dispossession of their own and their neighbour's country. However, the role of the guide was also a transitory one. The guide was only useful at the edge of the frontier at a time and a point in time when Europeans were pushing beyond the boundaries of their own known knowledge. Once the way was known to Europeans, the traditional the Aboriginal knowledge converted a claim in a recognisable form, the path of one power, perhaps the main. For example, how blazed the trees on his return to winter on the second trip, there were only a clear path for others to follow. Indeed, Parkway's made to the bush by how I was hastening the closure of the Newcastle Penal Station. Four months after Howe's journey, the Commandant Morrison complained that four convicts in a sea party had absconded from Patterson's planes following the path made by Mr. Another track placed by the Reverend 
George Augustus Middle, which became known as the Parsons Road, also became a well used escape route from December 1821, about three months after the name. Middleton himself had also travelled over leaving Newcastle guided by an unnamed Aboriginal companion. With tracks established, the role of professional guide was effectively finished for journeys to the hunter, but in the valley itself, a new role for local guides began to emerge. Newly arrived immigrant farmers coming to claim their grants after 1821 most often came from Sydney by ship before heading up the river from Newcastle to their start point of Wallace Parks. They too were faced with a seemingly trackless and unknown wilderness through which to pass before they could get to their grants. Most settlers could get to Wallace Plains by boat, but from there further travel was overlooked. At this jump off point, the local pool of guides appears to have operated taking new settlers inland. Now John Brown arrived here around May 1822 with the promise of 2,000 acres. Taken to his grant by an Aboriginal guide, he named his new property Bull Warren. The name which was given to him by that Aboriginal man. And Brown um, reported that the name Bull Warren meant flash of rock. Bull Warren's of course still In May 1823, the brothers Robert and Helene Scott hired a horse from a Wallace Plains farmer named Morgan and set off towards their grant, covering 20 miles the first day. With no Aboriginal men at Wallace Plains, they had started without a guide. And the following morning, as they were preparing to pack up camp, a young Aboriginal boy appeared out of the bush. Scott's servant, also named John Brown, kept a journal in which he related the encounter. And he wrote, We asked him what his name was and where he was going. He said the white men called him Ben Davis, and he was going along with us was for Binky Morgan sent him, which we was very glad of. We had been trying to get one of the blacks to go with us, but none of them happened to be at the settlement at the time. And this boy happened to go there soon after we had left, and Morgan had sent him after us. We set off with Ben Davis as a guide, and he seemed very much pleased and kept talking all the way he went. But we did not understand it. But what we could make out, he was telling us about. Ben Davis stayed with the party three days until they reached Patrick's Plain, which is now similar. He accompanied Scott on kangaroo shooting expeditions, and he acted as an intermediary and interpreter on two separate occasions along the way. When, Scott, um, when the Scots moved on there for the grant to back to Glendon, though, Ben Davis left them. It appears from Brown's account that the settler Morgan was acting as a go-between, arranging guides for at least some of the parties in the head. Now John Brown left Glenn after about 25 weeks, heading to Newcastle to pick up a ship back to Sydney and eventually returned to England. Making his way to Wallace Plains, he once again employed the use of an Aboriginal guide to find his way and wrote, The next morning I set off again with a black man as a guide, and I agreed to give him some tobacco when I got to the settlement. Now back in Glenn, Robert Scott was still finding his way through the bush. On the 15th of October, he wrote in his journal, Emma and I agreed to walk Nelson's Plains across the country if we could have got a native to show us the way. However, it seems there to be a grand cobra feast somewhere in the neighbourhood, and nothing in the world could induce them to be absent from such an entertainment. The cobra is a long, thin animal that lives in particular rivers in this country. As we could not get a native, Mitchell and I were afraid to trust ourselves in the forest. Therefore, we only walked to the same spot we disembarked from last night. Scotsman. <laughs> Scott's reluctance to go into the bush without a guide was indicative of the newly arrived Europeans' nervousness about the bush and acknowledges both their dependency on Aboriginal guides and awareness of this dependence. Another settler in the Patrick Plains area, James Moody, was also guided from Lost Plains in August 1823. But he wrote to the colonial secretary that if the assistant surveyor would, quote, give me the necessary particulars of that part of the country called, say, Patrick's Plains, so that's to enable me to proceed through the bush. I'd make an attempt to find the body assistance of some of the natives. The guides helped help the settlers find their grants for local men, employed as required in the service, through the agency of some of the more established settlers like the more. These local men most often appeared to guide the payment in tobacco of other European goods. <coughs> the use of guides by settlers looking for their grants was also a short term proposition. 
between 1822 and 25, the assistant government surveyor, Henry Dengar, was moving inland surveying the valley of the settlers and rare holes. His work increasingly made the place familiar to Europeans and reduced the need for guides. Although strangers and visitors still employed Aboriginal guides for hunting trips or collecting trips later. Now, the use of guides for exploring parties and later for settlers was widespread in the hunting valley, as it was throughout colonial Australia. Few serious expeditions headed off without one. As Greg Blythe has noted, while advancing the invasion of their country, these men were also realists, responding to the opportunities presented by the European needs and using their traditional knowledge and skills to maximise their own chances and survival 